Good afternoon everybody, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alec McCutcheon from Unicom, we're very pleased to be hosting today. Our guest presenter is Michael Neer. Uh, Michael is President of Sapir Consulting and he's a very well known presenter at conferences around the world. Indeed, I've had the pleasure of hearing him speak very recently last month at the Agile Business Conference and he also was voted recently one of the best speakers at the Nordic Project Zone Summit. He's best-selling book you may have heard of is called the Agile PMO and this is also the theme of today's webinar it seems by the number of people registering an extremely popular topic at the moment and the good news is at the end of the webinar uh, we're going to be holding a draw for five attendees to have the chance of winning Michael's audiobook also called the Agile PMO leading the effective value-driven project management office a practical guide so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael and there will then be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Over to you, Michael. Alec, uh, thank you very much for the lovely introduction and hello uh, uh, all of you out there. I'm going to uh, spend the next 30 minutes to uh, summarize experiences that we've been um, uh, seeing, having and experiencing in what the Agile PMO is and what it is about. So I'm going to start with the end in mind. This is something I like doing. So um, hmm. not moving to the next slide. We're stuck here a bit. So for some reason, it always works three minutes before. Um, here we go. All right. So I'm going to start with the end in mind, and um, just if there's something wrong, just uh, Alec and the team at, with Unicom just uh, text me. So this is this is what we're seeing, and this is the um, um, a model for what an agile PMO uh, can and um, our experiences should be. And there are four facets, four dimensions that we're seeing that is relevant for creating this Agile PMO, which we're going to talk about later what that means to have an Agile PMO. So uh, the first one, which we're going to discuss in the next 30 minutes, is um, uh, the idea of effective streamlined delivery and reducing the waste. And uh, we'll talk about selection and prioritization, choosing the valuable projects, and then a lot of emphasis on resource allocation and controlling and limiting the mix. And uh, last five minutes or so, if we have the time on Agile leadership. So this was adapted from a one or two day uh, or even three day uh, training that we do on the Agile PMO. And we're going to start with uh, the first one first. A few words uh, to uh, add to have a picture of me, you know, who's speaking. I'm, I am president of Secure Consulting, have written quite a few books. I do SAFE, a scaled Agile framework. Um, consulting as well and you'll see concepts from SAFE within this presentation and uh, how it's related to uh, agility and the Agile PMO. So here's a tricky question and this is something I like asking uh, participants and Alec mentioned that uh, he was with me about um, uh, a month ago in the Agile Business Conference. I think they're kind of tricky questions if you're leading a PMO. Definitely this, the fifth, uh, the fourth bullet that you have here is kind of an associative uh, game that I like to ask people is uh, complete the sentence. Yes, we have a PMO in the organization and. And the answers are usually uh, kind of unhappy. Um, most of the answers tend to be yes, we have a PMO in the organization and we're not very happy with it or uh, it's not delivering value or, um, or sometimes you get some uh, vehement, some, some nasty comments from project managers or people in agile organizations that they're really unhappy with what their PMO in the organization delivers. And actually, if, if you look at research, you see that we have an issue with the uh, PMO model. There is something corrupt about it. Um, on the top left, you see a research uh, by Gartner that uh, 30, this is from 2013, uh, 30 to 50% uh, failure rate is uh, due to distinctive mismatch between what the organization is uh, expecting and what the PMO is delivering. So uh, this is something that we've been seeing uh, quite often, as well as the research by ESI International, that's a consultancy. And um, they're showing that if there is a six-stage uh, model for maturity of a PMO, most PMOs are stuck somewhere. Uh, just to interpret this uh, diagram, the lighter the shade, that means uh, fully embedded. You have uh, to the right of this diagram, you have the uh, legend. 
So, um, and, and the darker, it means it's not embedded yet. So, you see that in most, uh, most PMOs, we're not really in, in um, advanced um, implementation stages, definitely as you go to more maturity. And there, we have an issue with our, our PMO model. And that's um, not a surprise if, if you read the papers, if you read uh, PMO blogs, if you read PMO articles, if you read articles about project management in general. And we probably need to do um, a kind of a, of a paradigm shift, and this is something we'll mention in a few minutes. So uh, the first question that comes to mind is, why do we create PMOs? And uh, the reason behind that is actually, uh, there's a bigger question there, and that is, um, why do we, What's the problem with the project organization that we need PMOs uh, to manage uh, the project organization? And, and it seems that most of the challenges we experience in a modern project organization are, are due to complexity. Uh, there is complexity in selection of projects. We'll talk about that. There is complexity in allocation of resources. We're going to talk about that as well. There is uh, complexity in forecasting in a dynamic system. Maybe we have some time to discuss that as well, and there is complexity in communication with teams or, or in organizations where there are more than several dozens or hundreds of um, employees in the overall organization. So the basic issue that we're ne we need to uh, solve and, uh, is, is complexity, and definitely uh, we, have, we have seen two main approaches in, in uh, general to solve complexity in organizations. Uh, one of them is the top-down control, and that's where traditional PMOs play a big part. So most organizations select the top-down control option. They use a PMO to uh, enforce the top-down approach, and they kind of, it kind of goes hand-in-hand, hand, um, the PMO uh, top-down uh, assistance in, in creation of process procedure. We'll get to that in a minute. And, and it's also based on this fallacy that process control works. And we'll talk about that in five minutes as well. Uh, on the other hand, another option to solve these challenges of complexity is a bottom-up approach, which is what we see in Agile. And this is where Agile PMOs play a big part. Um, usually what happens is that uh, uh, PMOs uh, would, would translate into these roles of responsibilities to uh, answer the complexity in a top-down approach. So PMOs usually adopt a traditional view to manage the complexity that is inherent in the project organization. The top-down uh, command and control translates usually to a linear waterfall life cycle, and we're using PMBOK or PRINCE2 to, to do that or any other uh, similar framework. And what we're doing is we're emphasizing process and methodology. Now, it's not a bad thing to do except when that is. And what we're seeing is that um, we tend to focus with our PMOs on um, the form rather than the value. Now, in the book, I've, I've written about six PMO failures. And actually, I'd like to discuss four of them. But we only have time for one. So I'll explain what that one is. But it's a very common PMO failure. Uh, this is the process PMO. And the process PMO is a PMO that uh, constantly handles a process and process improvement and methodologies. And I am not saying that there's anything wrong in process. Uh, improvement and process um, emphasis. I'm just saying that if the PMO uh, spends more than half of his time or 40% of the time on, on uh, process, including way of work, including um, a methodology, including the, the, the waterfall um, procedures, templates, uh, tools and techniques, and so on, uh, we're losing something. And that's usually where PMOs tend to fail. That relates to the slide we've just seen. And and we're seeing that the PMOs that fail are those that um, follow, tend to follow those uh, road to failure, such as, as uh, emphasis on process, em emphasis on tools, emphasis on tactics, rather than being a value enabler um, in the organization. And the question, next question, of course, is what is a value enablement? So, um, actually, there's a, there's a bigger question uh, there, and that is why would we want to have a PMO anyway? So, in other words, what value can we get from a PMO, and what quantifiable target function can we get from a PMO? 
And actually, this leads to an even bigger question, which is, what is value in our organization in the first place? So before we even go into an Agile PMO, and that's a question we tend to forget, we want to ask ourselves, where do we get value in our organization? And mostly the answer is by performing projects and programs, depending on the industry and so on, um, that uh, enable us to, to create value. And the next question is, what constrains the organization ability? And the first and foremost answer here is, or another question, which answer is really important is, how can we use a PMO to enable value creation? This is crucial to understand. There is often uh, a mismatch between uh, the way the organization creates value and what the PMO does. And we need to align those two. We need to understand how we create value, and the question is, how do we enable a PMO to create value? Um, what we've seen, and this is based solely on experience, what we see here is experience based for the last 10 years or so of working organizations, kind of con conducted or, or kind of created this model, um, not theoretical, more, more in practice. We see these four areas that are really important for PMO value enablement. We need to answer these four in order to have a, a value enabling a project management office, which we call also an Agile PMO. We're going to talk about uh, shortly uh, cover each and one of those uh, facets right now. So we'll talk, start talking about effective streamlined uh, delivery, and that's reducing waste. Uh, these are the seven wastes known as MUDA in lean manufacturing, and um, the, next, the next step actually is to look into what are the wastes that you have in your process. I, I mentioned this a quote from Oscar Wilde that the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. So many times we create more process in traditional environments, in the command and control environments, we tend to introduce more and more rather than reduce it. And this is one of the biggest um, challenges we have with uh, traditional, what I call traditional PMOs. Um, but the waste is not only in the process, the waste is also in the project themselves. So. It's not that we're only seeing waste in the process that we're adding. We're also in having waste in the projects themselves. And I'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, we're going to skip this slide. And I'm going to share these slides over LinkedIn. So you might as well uh, connect over LinkedIn. Uh, you'll find this, these slides in, in an hour or so. I'll post them up on LinkedIn. You can download them uh, from there. Um, so. One of the biggest uh, areas of waste is waste in non-value added work. So if you map your projects, you start finding that most of your waste in, is non-value added queues, blockers, and impediments. The problem is that PMOs tend to focus on accelerating the value added work. There is less meat there. If you're familiar with flame manufacturing, you found that there is much more improvement in looking at what, is, um, what are the cues and shortening the cues rather than focusing on the value added work and optimizing that. There's actually less meat in optimizing the value added work. There's much more meat in looking at what we're doing and what doesn't add value and what does add waste. For example, non-value added work, which needs then to be um, divided into required non-value added, such as uh, user acceptance testing. It's not a value added. We can discuss that, of course. But it is required. So you need to um, differentiate between the value added work, which usually takes 10% of the time. If you look at a project timeline, it tends to be 5 to 10%. 15% at most is value-added work. The rest of the time tends to be a waiting time. And this is, this is uh, just fascinating to see that in most organizations, half of the, uh, of the time is, is non-value-added, non-required uh, work. So that's the first place an Agile PMO wants to um, focus. And uh, that was in a nutshell. We're going to move now to the next part. But before we do that, I've been saying Agile PMO, Agile PMO so many times. What is an Agile PMO? Well, it depends. That's a good consultant answer. So it does depend. It definitely sounds exciting. We see a lot of interest around that. It definitely gets people to join, join us here on this, on this um, webinar. But let's be a bit more serious. It's an entity that accomplishes various role -based, um, uh, roles based on these specific organizations. We're going to have two slides here, which I'm not going to share later on the, uh, on the PowerPoint, because these are something that's almost uh, 
kind of build them together and we don't like to share them, but I'm going to share them here with you. Um, what we've seen is that we can classify the Agile team in organizations based on the type of the organization. So if it's a software IT organization, um, the Agile PMO might be interfacing with the Scrum of Scrums, or it might be part of the Scale to Agile Framework PPM um, uh, role or stakeholders. If you move into a hybrid organization, that one which is software plus something, software plus hardware, software part of a bigger system, um, there's a set of articles that handle that, and I'll be happy to share that. The different roles for the Agile PMO in this scenario if it's a non-software organization that rolls out what we call an Agile PMO, it would be the primary leader of Agile initiatives. So the answer of what is an Agile PMO depends on the type of organization uh, that you work in, but not only, it also depends on where you are in terms of the process. So um, definitely if, if um, if you're working in a waterfall organization, the Agile PMO would mostly be handling managing the emerging Agile teams and connecting between the phase gate uh, top-down view and Kanban or, or uh, Scrum teams. And also would be burdened with reporting, translating, and educating management uh, reports. So if it, you're in a waterfall organization, the Agile PMO is an entity that has a certain role. But if you're already in an Agile organization, so the Agile PMO would be uh, an entity to lead the Agile to the portfolio level to expand SAFE if you're using SAFE to the overall organization or to be a change leadership entity. So there are several variants that we've seen here based on our experience of what an Agile PMO might be. It is not one thing in each and every organization. And one thing I'm going to mention later on is that the translation or the, the adaptation needs to be down, done on a peer organization basis according to what makes sense. So I'm going to move now to uh, selection and prioritization. That's one of those things that we get uh, a lot of questions about. How do we use uh, an Agile PMO for better selection and prioritization? So uh, we want to move into a, a selection process that's more lightweight and that's more uh, focus-based, but not as, as hefty as most organizations use. And what I found the most useful, again, is a, schedule, a scaled Agile framework. That's what we've been using in most cases, but it's not the only flavor. I'm trying one here, but there are other ways to do this selection process, which is um, lightweight and focused on current knowledge. So safe example, and if you go to the scaledagileframework.com, uh, you'll find this for free. So you just click on the area and you'll find how a safe handles prioritization. So it handles a mix of opportunities, and this mix of opportunities goes into a funnel, and this funnel is reviewed, but the review uh, process step has a certain Kanban limit. So we know how many we can do per month or per, per, uh, per sprint if you want. And then we do an analysis, and we use uh, the, um, the safe approach of uh, weighted shortest job first, which is a heuristic to uh, allocate uh, priorities. And then we create a portfolio backlog for these new um, identified and analyzed opportunities. And um, this is one way to do that. We found it extremely useful. So I've mentioned just for example that we weight them according to the cost of delay. Now, this is done. This is from Don Runnerstein, uh, the principle of product development. A very good book to learn more about how we do that. But you can get to this information freely. And this is what we found the most effective approach to um, doing a, a, a selection process, and this is almost a cut and paste type of approach to do a, a lighter weight type of selection process. And what we see in many organizations and is this, um, this uh, a Dilbert comic that in many cases you have a new opportunity and, and someone will say, I need a budget estimate for my project, but I don't have a scope for it, designed for it yet. And then, okay, my estimate is over three and a half million dollars. And then the answer is, well, you don't have any, uh, you don't know anything about my project. And then the response, of course, is that makes the two of us. And this is, this is right, it's funny now, but it's, it's not that funny because many times we spend a lot of effort. I've been working with business analysts in the banking industry for over six years, and I see them wasting six months for putting together a business case that it's totally wasteful. It's, it, it's, it's not used as it should be. So the question here is the Agile, or the answer is the Agile PMO is our mechanism to reduce the effort that we're investing in selection and in prioritizing the valuable opportunities. Now, you can use what I've just shown, which is 
again, you can go to scalagile.com, upper left side, click on there, you'll find just what I've sh shown there with all the best practices and everything is explained, or you can, you can create a lightweight uh, approach based on that of your own. What we've seen the most useful for selection and prioritization is using a Kanban mechanism for new for analysis of new opportunities, very similar to what I've just now shown from Scaled Agile. So this handles both these uh, roles of the Agile PMO of effective streamlined delivery and selection prioritization. I guess that the, the most important element of the Agile PMO is resource allocation. This is, by the way, uh, the book that Alec mentioned that I've written, but which I'm not, uh, I think is, is a bit outdated. It's almost two years old, and I need, I'm going to add more to it as an appendix. Um, most of that book discusses the, the failures and then resource allocation. So okay, let's talk a bit about resource allocation. I'm going to breeze through a few slides that later on you can read uh, and download from LinkedIn. So um, this, this is a just allocation of two resources across two projects. And this looks very, very easy. But the problem is that in our organizations, they have many more projects and many more resources. So what do we do? Well, we do a big mistake. Um, the underlying allocation, uh, um, uh, project allocation uh, problem is known as multi-project resource constraint scheduling, it's NP. So those of you who are not familiar, I'm not going to talk about non-deterministic polynomial problems. These are very difficult problems. And what we usually do is we use our PMOs and our projects to create critical path method analysis analysis of these projects. So this is what usually what we do. We'll create uh, project plans based on PMBOK. The PMO will, 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 will root for that. And then we'll do resource pooling. And then we'll do resource allocation. And then we'll do resource leveling. And that's, there, there is a big mistake under, uh, underlined, a uh, big mistake underneath. Uh, what we do is we have these uh, projects. The PMO will create a resource pool. We'll do resource allocation. And we'll try to optimize our resources using a top-down approach. Now, if you do that, you're actually not able to do that for big projects. So you want to have an optimal schedule. But if you have more than 15 projects and 100 resources, you're not able to solve for the uh, optimal solution. Usually what we do is use heuristic schedules. And uh, once you have change, you need to resolve the entire um, mechanism. And PMOs do that, and they use a lot of sophisticated tools. These tools are always um, uh, faulty. At, at some to some degree, um, and this is the example why heuristics will never go to optimal schedule. And the previous slide explains what that means uh, to to um, to try to solve it in an optimal manner. Now, we need to move away from these approaches and use an alternative approach. And again, that's the agile PMO's role is to use an alternative approach to the uh, uh, top-down, overall, overarching critical path method um, optimization, which can't be done. And our, our preference is critical chain project management. So if you haven't read Critical Chain Project Management by Eli Goldrott, a uh, bestseller from 1997, it's a good time to, to read that. That will explain a lot of the problems and challenges we have when we do uh, resource constraint scheduling that we tend to forget. So a very important book to read. Now the Agile PMO needs to decide what approach is he carrying out in order to overcome resource allocation challenges. Critical chain is one approach, but there's also CONWIP, which stands for constant work in, pro in uh, process or in progress. So any, any flavor will work. The Agile PMO needs to understand that uh, top-down resource allocation of the entire resources to all the project is, is unsolvable. It's a fallacy. We can't really do that. And we need to find a, an alternative to do a top-down resource allocation. And one of what Critical Chain is saying, use your critical resources. And, and it's in a nutshell, this is about 3 to 5% of your overall resources tend to be critical. An Agile PMO would focus on those critical resources and see how he's getting the most um, out of emphasizing and, and, um, and uh, prioritizing work according to these uh, critical resources. And th this is just an example for using Conwip and different levels of work and process in the system. Again, I prefer critical chain as an approach for 
uh, resource constrained uh, scheduling. So this was a few words about resource allocation. And then uh, as much as I have three more minutes on agile leadership. And that's the fourth uh, role of uh, the agile PMO. So usually we have these questions when we want to move into an agile portfolio perspective. The two of the first two we mentioned so far, but there are other questions that emerge which are how do we align uh, agile processes with governance? Very valid question. How do we operate in our regulated industry? And how do we balance between agile products and the organizations? So uh, definitely there has to be a vision for what an agile PMO is. I mentioned that a few slides ago. It has to be a vision. There has to be an agreed lease set of, de of deliverables. I'll give you an example now. Uh, there is a, a vision example, but here's an example Surprisingly, of someone who's read the book about a year and a half ago, and the full article is on PM Hut. You have the link on uh, below, and these are the objectives that they've defined and the value that they're seeing from translating um, their needs into the, the overall objective into the value that they're seeing in the organization. Again, I'm going to leave this aside. I'm not going to read through all of it. Uh, mostly, it's it's about understanding how the Agile PMO will interface with the Agile teams. It's, it's really about collaboration, empowerment, self-management, and very important servant leadership. And that's where we're running into trouble because, and I mentioned this in the beginning, there is a certain perception of what PMOs are and um, what we want them to be in an agile organization. This is probably the biggest challenge. Probably the biggest transformation from the PMO is this paradigm shift from the bad guys that keep on uh, policing the project organization to a collaborative servant approach, servant, mat, servant leadership uh, type of approach to enabling the agility throughout the organization. This is very difficult because if you talk with, with um, um, agile organizations, you say PMO, um, they'll start running uh, toward the other direction. Having said that, there is real value in everything we've said so far to having a PMO because a lot of the things that we're, we're, we're uh, achieve, we're trying to achieve, for example, reducing waste, uh, focusing on value, doing uh, top-down uh, critical resource allocation, um, doing uh, selection and prioritization, cannot be done by uh, the agile structures that we see in place. We need to have a kind of, of a, an enabling entity, and what we're seeing is that it, that enabling entity uh, the Agile PMO is the best enabling entity that we can have in organizations to promote these um, uh, roles. So uh, a few things here that I'm going to skip about how do you do that. I do want to um, linger for a minute here. It, it's a change. There's a, there's a paradigm change, and we need to use a methodology. And uh, I like using Cotter uh, framework for introducing change in the organization. And if it's an agile PMO, then yes, we create a sense of urgency to why we need it. And we need a coalition with the project organization to roll it out. And we need to share the vision of what the agile PMO is about. We need to help uh, get help from the agile organizations. And we need to have those short-term wins, for example, reducing waste, both in process and both in projects. And we need to anchor the, the change. Um, so in a nutshell, this is what we're seeing that makes, uh, makes sense and works for us. We need Agile PMOs because we need an entity that will help us to uh, effectively uh, a streamline delivery, reduce the non-value added work both in project and in process. We need the Agile PMO in order to um, select and prioritize uh, our projects, our opportunities. A SAFE doesn't deal with projects, so we need an entity that knows how to deal with projects. And we need the Agile PMO to help with resource allocation and matching a top-down rule of critical resource allocation to uh, manage those Agile local teams. And last and, and, and uh, definitely not least is we need um, Agile leadership and definitely lead new PMO perceptions. Definitely the weighing is different according to the organization and the need. However, uh, a good value enabling Agile PMO needs to touch base on each and every one of those concepts and see how is he 
or she enabling value on each one of those um, uh, corners or, or, or facets, if you will. So this was a snapshot into what we're seeing and experiencing over the past five, uh, seven years, almost with, with transferring or, or uh, transforming into PMOs that are more value-enabling and are more agile and work with agile organizations and promote agility uh, in organizations. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for uh, being here with me, um, all of you here. I'm, I'm very happy to lead this uh, practical workshop. The next public one for one day, this runs between one to three days, so the next one that we have with Unicom, who's um, um, hosting this webinar, is on the 3rd December in London. Five of you will uh, uh, get a free audio copy of audio book of the Agile PMO once we're completed, and we'll send you emails with the uh, um, details, please uh, connect over LinkedIn and I'm going to show this uh, PowerPoint over there um, and any questions, I'll be happy to take them then and also now. So if you have any questions, we have about uh, 14 minutes or so, so I'll be happy to, to take them now. Alec and uh, team, um, any questions there? If you've got one just come in, Michael, uh, I'll read it back to you. What is the difference between the Agile PMO and Scrum of Scrums? Right, that, that's, that's a good question. I think that um, um, Scrum of Scrums handles Scrum teams from a Scrum perspective and will not necessarily take care of other, other facets that we've it's a partial solution if we want to take um, um, PMOs to or want to take project organizations to the portfolio level, most cases the Scrum of Scrums will not solve uh, the challenges that we've been experiencing. So that's a very good question. Uh, other questions? Second one just come in. Uh, what do you recommend as first steps for implementing an Agile PMO? Um, Again, again, a good one. Um, I, I would say that um, definitely think uh, caught or eight steps of change, and uh, look at look at the need, and sit down with your stakeholders, uh, have a collaboration around that, and discuss what what's what is our our um, value adding, um, what what are, are the our um, excuse me. Um, value streams and where we need to help them and how would a PMO help that? Answering these questions will, will kind of, of leap, uh, will help you leap forward with an Agile uh, PMO. Uh, more? Thank you. Good question. Another question, Michael, this is from Damien. Uh, he's asking what topics will be handled and focused on during the 3rd of December workshop in London? Um, it's it's uh, Working through the four uh, facet model, we do. We have a case study, and we develop uh, throughout the, the one day. We use a case study as uh, developing um, uh, and an exercise, and developing each and every one of those concepts. What we've seen here is kind of a nutshell. So, uh, in one day, we're able to handle about uh, sixty to seventy percent of what we've seen, or fifty to sixty seventy percent. We have an exciting. Uh, um, um, simulation that handles resource allocation. We have a case study that goes throughout the day, and throughout the case, using the case study, we answer we answer questions and concepts and, and uh, queries about how do we do selection and prioritization? How do we do um, redu reduction of waste? What does that mean to do that? And this is a kind of elaborate case study. Actually, uh, usually leaves a taste for more. We just had this about a month ago, and I have to say that. The feedback was we need more more of it. So that's that means it that means it's it's good, but there is more to it. Anything else? Uh, any other questions popping in? I think no. I think that's it at the moment. I think we just had those three questions. So thank you very much again, Michael. And if anybody would like to come to the workshop, I believe we do still have a couple of seats available. Uh, the, the details on our website also at unicom uk and we we're also planning to reschedule the workshop again next year, probably late February time. 
Yes, and I think that the, the, the upcoming one, uh, you need to hurry because it seems like we have quite a few, quite a few already registered. So uh, it seems like we're going to have a full, full house. So uh, hurry up or, or um, feel free to join us on the next one, February, or if maybe we have uh, uh, enough to open a uh, next one. Who knows? But it looks very good, and, and definitely the, the topic gains a lot, is gaining a lot of interest because it's this question of how do you scale Agile outside, outside software and outside um, uh, the program level. And I think this is a question that the Agile PMO is able to answer, and we're discussing uh, on our workshops. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, uh, everyone, and goodbye.